Okay, so for my exploration activity, I would like to spend the next six hours constantly scrolling my Facebook feed. I wonder why the enemies keep getting the drop on me. Today, we're going to talk about exploration activities in Pathfinder 2nd Edition on this episode of The Local Disaster Tour Guide. My name is Mark, and I am the local disaster tour guide. That's right, I am the storyteller who is telling you, you don't need to worry about that crisis management option that I listed under exploration activities. I'm sure it's not important. Welcome to a journey through the fantastic world of TTRPGs like Pathfinder and Starfinder. Today we are continuing my Storytelling in Pathfinder 2e series with part one of a discussion of exploration activities for PCs in Pathfinder 2e. Now for those of you who are new to this series, storytelling in Pathfinder 2e is an exploration of the tips, tricks, and advice that Paizo offers storytellers to help them be more successful at the gaming table. This series is intended for storytellers of every skill level, from beginner to advanced, and even if Pathfinder 2e is not your preferred system, I still encourage you to stick around and be part of the conversation. Over the years, I have seen that studying a multitude of games as a storyteller can often inspire you with ideas to bring back to your preferred game. Now, we have been working through the different modes of play in Pathfinder 2e for a couple of months now, and Paizo breaks Pathfinder 2e into three distinct modes of play. Encounter mode, exploration mode, and downtime mode. And right now, we're working through the second mode in that series, which is exploration mode. We've talked about how Exploration Mode is a mode of play that focuses on the concept of discovery inside of storytelling, and we've also discussed how Exploration Mode exists to help our players interact with the world that their characters inhabit. This is really the mode of play that exists to help make our world come alive when we run our games. Now, we have taken a pretty thorough look at some of the Game Master side of the screen when it comes to Exploration Mode, but now we've switched over and we're taking a look at the other side of the screen, at the different things that our player characters get to do during, well, Exploration Mode. And the core of that conversation is Exploration Activities, which we're going to start a discussion of today. Now, to be honest, Exploration Activities represents a gigantic chunk of what your players will be doing in exploration mode, so ultimately I decided it was best if I broke this conversation into two parts. So today I'm going to be taking a big look at what exploration activities are in Pathfinder 2e, and some of the big picture advice that Paizo gives us for using exploration activities, and then in next week's video I'm going to come back and I'm going to talk about the specific examples of exploration activities that Paizo gives us, as well as offering a few of the unique exploration activities I've developed for my own game, and kind of talking through those specific examples. As always with this series, I like to give you some references so that if you want to read more in depth on these particular topics, you can do that. And the material that we're going to be talking about today comes from both the Core Rulebook and the Game Mastery Guide. In the core rulebook, you can find content on exploration activities on pages 479 and 480 of the Playing the Game chapter for players, as well as pages 496 to 497 of the Game Mastery chapter. Also, if you have the Game Mastery Guide for Pathfinder 2e, you should check out pages 17 to 19, which go into a little more detail on exploration activities as well. So. Those are some references you can check out if you want to learn more about this topic.
So I want to give a huge shout out today to the sponsor of this video, Arknight. Arknight is a Texas-based company that makes TTRPG accessories out of beautiful and durable die-cut plastic. They offer products like spell templates, maps, object sheets, and the product that we're advertising today, RPG mini mounts. Huh, these are kind of small. Maybe we should go to the map and show you how these work. Okay, so what I want to do first is I want to do a slow pan and show you some of the different cuts that come from the mini mounts at Arknight. As you can see, there is a wide variety of options. You've got spiders and horses and unicorns. You've got sea creatures like sea turtles and bears and rhinos. And if I'm being entirely honest, I got the Kickstarter which includes some Kickstarter exclusive mini mounts. I honestly don't remember which ones are which, but you can see that this collection comes with an incredible variety of creatures that your players can ride into battle. As you can see here, using the mini mounts on your maps is very easy to do. Pawns and figurines will sit very easily on top of your minis, allowing you to quickly demonstrate when your character is mounted or dismounted. And as I've already noted, this collection comes with a variety of different mini mounts that you can use. So as you can see, Robin our warrior is riding on the back of a black dragon. Ampara has a unicorn. Hoshi the witch picked up a displacer beast somewhere. And even the halfling chef has a giant frog that they are riding into battle. One more thing that I would like to note about the mini mounts is that they come compatible with spaces where you can insert the flat plastic minis from Arknight into the mount so they work seamlessly with other Arknight products. Now my wife and I do hope to invest in the flat plastic minis eventually, but right now we're using the Pathfinder Ponds that Paizo produces, and as you can see, they also work perfectly well with Arknight's mount minis. So that's just a quick view of how you can use these products at your gaming table. And I just want to say I have a great deal of respect for Arknight, and my wife and I are super excited to be working with them as sponsors for this channel. The die-cut plastic that they use is incredibly durable and beautiful, making for products that are going to last, and you get a lot of product for a very low price. One of my favorite things about Arknight products is just how easy it is to store everything that Arknight makes. For example, I actually backed the Mini Mounts Kickstarter, and even though I got dozens of Mini Mounts to use in my campaign, they all fit neatly in this single box. This doesn't take up much room on my shelf, meaning that I have plenty of space for the other accessories in my collection. The last thing I want to say about Arknight is this, I have been a customer of Arknight for years, and they have an absolutely fantastic team. I've backed their Kickstarters, I've actually gotten to talk to them at Gen Con, and I have done a number of orders through this company, and on the single occasion that an order went wrong, their customer service team was extremely quick to address the problem, fix the problem. I am blown away by the professionalism and courtesy of this company, and they are wonderful to work with, and again, Thank you, Arknight, for sponsoring this video. If you want to check out their products, I'll throw a link in the video description below. All right, let's get started. Okay, so to kick off this conversation about exploration activities, it's probably healthy to start with why is this important? We'll talk a little bit more about the specific tips and tricks that Paizo gives us later in this video, but I want to have a conversation about why first, because I think that this concept of exploration activities kind of runs into the same, I guess you could say, hesitation that some players experience when we talk about the modes of play in Pathfinder 2e. You may remember back when we first kicked off this modes of play series, we talked about how, for some people, modes of play, encounter mode, exploration mode, downtime mode, feels too rigid, too mechanical, and almost seems to remove the fun and fluid aspect of playing a tabletop RPG. Now, in the discussion of modes of play, we talked about how I think Paizo's decision to break the game into distinct modes of play 
actually helps in storytelling because it helps us to focus on the purpose of different scenes or different portions of the stories that we are creating. Just like encounter mode and exploration mode serve a different purpose inside of the story, I think that exploration activities serve a distinct purpose in the story as well. And depending on the side of the screen that you're sitting, that purpose is going to be a little bit different. If you're sitting on the Game Master side of the screen, it's going to serve a purpose of making your story more efficient, and we'll talk about that. While if you're sitting on the player side of the screen, it helps to set the focus of the story, at least in regards to your character. Okay, so let's talk about this for a little bit. The concept of an exploration activity is pretty straightforward. Your character selects a particular activity that they are focusing on during exploration mode, and that is the main thing that they're doing. So they might choose the scouting exploration activity, or they might choose to repeat a spell, or they could choose to search. There are a variety of different activities available, but from a player's perspective, really what the exploration activities does is it answers the question, what is the most important thing to my character in this moment? A character that is focused on searching or investigating such as a rogue who is searching for traps or an investigator who's trying to puzzle out the meaning of some ancient hieroglyphics, their focus is on uncovering secrets in the environment around them. Or the bard could be choosing to repeat a skill, such as the diplomacy skill, to try and persuade a particular person or group of people to complete an activity for the party. In the second instance, the bard is not so much concerned about what they can discover in the environment, but rather is concerned about making sure that the people that they are leading are going to complete the task at hand. In the notes that Paizo gives Game Masters, they discuss about how players might try to do everything and ultimately get overwhelmed because, well, they just can't. And that's kind of the reality of this rule set. Player characters can't do everything, but they can do something, and the concept of exploration activities is a clean mechanical way of allowing your player, and therefore their character, to focus their efforts on a particular goal or a particular activity to the benefit of the group and ultimately the story. And the great thing is, on the Game Master side of the screen, exploration activities really help you to make gameplay a lot more efficient. When I'm running my home game of Pathfinder 2e, I will actually write the various exploration activities that my party needs to cover right up here on this board. And then I will tell players to put their name beside whichever activity they want their character to cover, and if that activity comes up during play, I immediately know who needs to roll that check, and I don't have to negotiate or argue with the players about who's doing what, where, when, why, or how. Setting exploration activities is a fantastic way of speeding up the gameplay so that exploration mode can effectively serve the story that you're telling. Now, exploration activities do have some other effects on the game and on the story that I think are worth examining from a big picture perspective as well. A lot of the activities that a PC can choose during exploration mode can affect other things that the character might be trying to accomplish, with a simple example being travel speed. Certain exploration activities simply cause you to travel slower, such as the avoid notice activity. So imagine that your character needs to travel from town A to town B. And normally they could get there in two days worth of travel. But your players also don't want their enemies to know about their movement. Well, your players could attempt to avoid notice as they travel, but that would cut their travel speed in half, meaning it would take them four days to make the journey, and now your players are faced with an interesting choice. Do they travel quickly so that they can get to their goal sooner, or do they travel stealthily and hope to avoid notice? You have a quick and clean mechanical effect to describe what is going on, while at the same time creating an interesting choice for your players. And allow me to say, that's just a very quick and simple example. With a lot of these different exploration activities that we will talk about in next week's video, 
You can certainly go deeper with any of these. When it comes to exploration activities, this is one of Pathfinder 2E's subtle ways of getting your players, and therefore their characters, to work together by diversifying their actions so that they are supporting one another. Maybe one character is scouting ahead and looking for enemies, while another character is trying to find hidden treasure. And then a third character is repeating a defensive spell so that if the party gets into combat, they will be better prepared to handle whatever enemy might come their way. By encouraging characters to select different exploration activities, ultimately what this does is provide a mechanical in-game reward for getting your players to think like a team. Teamwork is very important in Pathfinder 2e. It's one of the key design elements of the game, so I do think that exploration activities serves this niche benefit of encouraging your players to have that team mindset during play, even if they aren't necessarily actively battling a monster at a given moment. And the final big picture of exploration activities is they serve as, well, a transition aid for storytellers and players when you move from exploration to a different mode of play, most commonly encounter mode. Switching scenes from exploring the dungeon to battling the monster can sometimes be a little confusing. But exploration activities actually help set the stage so you as a storyteller can transition scenes a little more easily and efficiently. One of the cool things that they did with Pathfinder 2e was create an initiative system where players can potentially roll multiple different skills for initiative depending upon what they're doing when the fight starts. So a character who is avoiding notice or sneaking around, they can roll stealth for initiative, while another character who is scouting would just roll perception as normal. And you could get other more interesting and niche skill cases for initiative. A character that is attempting to track a monster might roll survival, while wizards who are preparing for an arcane duel might actually roll arcana as their initiative skill. You can get really creative with this, and the use of exploration activities can very easily support these transitions. In fact, one of the ways that Paizo describes exploration activities is as a jumping off point for other scenes, whether it is other exploration scenes or your regular encounter scenes as well, the exploration activities help set the stage for where your party is, what your party is doing, and what you need to decide as a storyteller to make that switch. So, now let's talk about some of the advice that Paizo gives on managing exploration activities. Okay, so the first tip that Paizo offers storytellers in regards to exploration activities actually comes from the last big picture item that we discussed, which is exploration activities are a jumping off point for transitioning to other scenes. Keep that in mind. Now that we know that, that should tell us that exploration activities are not intended to be rigid, character-defining moments that cannot be deviated from in any way, shape, form, or fashion. You may remember a little bit ago I discussed how some people don't like the concept of exploration activities because they feel like exploration activities are too rigid, and I think it's important to realize that Paizo never intended for exploration activities to be the super rigid definitions of exactly what a character is doing at every moment for an entire day, but rather a generalized description of their overall focus that can serve as a starting point for a deeper exploration in a given scene. Okay, I know that was a mouthful of words. What does that mean? Let's start with a simple example. You have a rogue who is using the exploration activity, Search for Traps. And, as a result of that activity, they roll high enough to detect a trap. Now, obviously, the rogue player would then have an opportunity to stop searching for traps and actually try to disarm the trap. They can drop out of that activity, Search for Traps, when something comes up that would cause them to naturally switch what they are doing in this case, switching from searching for traps to disarming the trap. I know that seems pretty simple, but you can apply this to a lot of things. Let's say you have a wizard who is trying to decode ancient magical sigils, and that wizard 
rolls high enough to realize that some of these sigils are guarding an ancient treasure room. Well, the wizard then could have the option to drop out of decoding the sigils to instead spend some time trying to open that ancient treasure room. The exploration activity is not a hard definition of the only thing that a player can do for an entire day, but rather it just kind of sets the stage for opening up new options, opening up new opportunities, or helping the game master and player transition from one moment or one scene to another. So as a game master, it's important to realize and communicate to your players that they can drop in and out of different exploration activities as is appropriate inside the game and inside the story. By the way, setting exploration activities can also help you transition back into exploration mode very quickly after an encounter or particular scene plays out. If you have a character who is scouting ahead for the party and your party encounters some monsters, once that encounter is over, since the player is in the scout role for the party, they transition straight back into doing that and you don't have to spend a lot of time discussing what the party wants to do now that the fight has ended. As long as you realize that exploration activities are intended to be flexible in this way, that characters can and will drop in and out of them throughout the course of a day, it will help you transition effectively and quickly during your game. Another thing that's important to realize is, in some situations, characters can try again. Now, this obviously isn't going to apply to every single exploration activity in every single session or every single scene of a game, but there may be circumstances where your character is using a particular exploration activity and they fail the role. But there is some reason inside of the game why their character might be inclined to repeat that role, and it is okay as a storyteller to allow that to happen when it's appropriate, Though, Paizo does offer that if characters want to repeat a given exploration activity, that they should describe in one fashion or another how they are changing their approach to reflect this second attempt. Now again, this is kind of a broad topic. It could apply to a lot of situations. But let's imagine a scenario where your players are exploring an ancient forest and looking for some lost ruins. And after a day of hard searching, they haven't found the ruins that they were looking for, but the map says they're in the right area. Well, in that situation, it would be natural for your players to want to try again the next day, and rather than just denying them the opportunity to repeat the check, you as a storyteller could ask them, okay, what would you like to do differently the second time around in order to try to find the ruins that you think you've missed? Just as exploration activities are intended to be flexible in that you can drop in and out of them, it's also important to remember that you can be flexible with exploration activities by allowing characters to repeat those activities or re-attempt those activities when there is a good reason inside of the story. Also, while they don't spend a lot of time discussing this in the Core Rulebook or the Game Mastery Guide, something that I do a lot at my tables is I will allow players to try and persuade me if they want to use a different skill than would be normal when it comes to a particular exploration activity. So, for example, if you have a rogue that would normally be using perception to try to find traps in a given area, but the party is traveling through an ancient forest, the player could try to convince me that they would rather use the nature skill to look for potential traps, and if the player is being creative enough, I would be willing to consider letting them use a variant skill for different exploration activities. Usually when I put exploration activities up on this board, what I will do is I will put a primary skill up as the default skill for whatever I expect players to roll, but when situations come up, the player in question can try to persuade me that a different skill that they have might be more appropriate. A really easy and common example would be a character who has a particularly relevant lore skill in a given scene. I might allow them to switch that lore skill out for whatever the normal role would be. I think exploration activities can be very flexible, and as a storyteller, viewing exploration activities through a flexible lens really puts them in a position to help the game and to make the game flow in a much more interesting fashion. Again. Variant skill checks for exploration activities is not really discussed directly by Paizo, 
but it is something that I've had some success with at my table, so it's something I thought I would mention to you. By the way, speaking of teamwork, there is a very important exploration activity that you as a game master should be aware of called Follow the Expert. Follow the Expert exists specifically to allow teammates to help other people on the team with skills that they would otherwise have no chance of being able to do. And Paizo actually uses the example of a rogue giving advice and tips and pointers to the party warrior so that the warrior just doesn't give away his location to every single enemy that the party comes across. The party warrior can use the follow the expert activity in that scenario to gain at least a decent chance of being able to use stealth effectively and it opens up some really good narrative moments as it allows the rogue and the warrior to roleplay out what it means for the rogue to be leading and for the warrior to be following the expert in that instance. Got a wizard who doesn't like to go rock climbing in their free time? That's okay. The barbarian expert in athletics could give them some pointers to help them get up that particularly intimidating rock face. Again, you have an opportunity to let the entire team participate in particular scenes and to create nice role-playing moments between different members of the party as one person assists another. Now, the last thing that Paizo talks about when it comes to exploration activities, at least from the Game Master's perspective, is the concept of improvising new activities, and this is a very important concept to keep in mind. Paizo has not written out every single thing that a player character might be able to do in a story. They have given us a lot of options, they have given us a lot of good options, and a lot of those options can be used in different flexible ways, but as a storyteller, you are encouraged to create new activities that are appropriate to your game, your story, and the party that is participating in that story. To give you an example, last year I was running a Hexploration adventure for my gaming group, and one of the exploration activities that I created for them was called Magical Research. In that particular instance, the purpose of the exploration that they were doing was to try to find hidden magical sites in a large area. And so the Magical Research activity helped them identify clues that could lead them to the different hidden magical locations. And it created an interesting trade-off because if the characters thought that they weren't close to one of those magical locations, they could skip magical research and focus on other activities, such as ones that might allow the party to move faster, but then they would run the risk of missing the very things that they were trying to hunt for. Improvising new activities can really help you zero in on what is important to your story and create interesting trade-offs, interesting choices for your players. Now, when it comes to improvising new activities, Paizo gives us a little bit of a guideline, and kind of the core of this conversation is, when you're improvising a new activity, you want to pause and think, how much effort does this new activity take in order for it to be something that could be maintained for a very long time, or if it's going to be something that is much more strenuous to use and that could only be maintained for short bursts. Some exploration activities can function effectively all day. Other exploration activities have a very limited window of how long players can use them before they might become fatigued. Good examples of the latter are the hustle activity or trying to repeat a spell, and Paizo kind of gives us this hint. When you're looking at improvising a new activity, how many actions would it take if you were doing it in combat? If that particular activity could be accomplished using a single action in a combat round, then imagining that activity as something that you're repeating relatively frequently, say once per round, over the course of a long period of time, would fall under the category of actions that could be maintained for, that could be maintained relatively indefinitely. For example, the defend activity allows you to start combat with your shield raised. And, well, it only takes one action to raise your shield during a fight. However, actions such as hustle or repeating a spell 
would be reflective of a combat round where a character was spending two actions in a round in order to accomplish those tasks. As such, those actions are going to be more strenuous and characters will be limited in how long they could maintain those actions before they would have to stop and rest. Now, you may be asking at this point, what about activities that would require a character to consistently burn all three actions in a given round in order to complete that activity? Well, if your character is burning three actions every round in order to maintain a particular activity, you're in a fight scene. That is literally what's going on. <laughs> Exploration mode does assume that characters are not moving at the highest possible intensity at the fastest possible pace, but rather that they're maintaining a more measured pace. And so when you're improvising new activities, ask yourself, is this something that would require just a little bit of effort in a round? That's something they can probably maintain. If it would be a lot of effort during a round, that would be limited in use. It would be similar to the hustle activity. And if it would eat up an entire round, well, roll initiative because something dangerous is happening. But those are just some of the pieces of advice that Paizo gives for managing exploration activities in Pathfinder 2e. Next week we're going to dive in and take a look at some of the specific examples that Paizo gives for exploration activities and I'll talk about a few of the exploration activities that I use in my home game as well. But, let me turn the conversation over to you. What are your thoughts on exploration activities? And do you have any big picture pieces of advice that you would apply to this particular mode of the game? Also, do you have any questions about exploration activities? Leave your thoughts in the comments down below, and I'll be happy to discuss those things with you. Also, if you enjoyed this video, like it, share it, subscribe to the channel. You can check out my free Discord and Patreon. Both of those are linked in the video description. Thank you so much for being here, and have a wonderful day.